There's the period of so-called regimented capitalism, Second World War up until mid-70s, roughly. No financial crises, banks t tightly controlled, no tax havens, no shell companies, all illegal. Treasury Department enforced the law. Then there's the period of neoliberalism, a reaction to regimented capitalism, late 70s to the present. It's a crucial part of the neoliberal programs. Uh, Milton Friedman, the economics guru, announced in a famous article, 1981, uh, the sole responsibility of the management of a corporation is self-enrichment. Anything else violates fundamental principles. So transfer decisions to the hands of private unaccountable enterprises whose sole responsibility is self-enrichment. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what's going to happen. The present form of capitalism says, let's destroy the environment in which humans can survive. Clearly suicidal. We'd have a much better one world if we were not driven by the needs of private profit and private consumption, and we were concerned with the common good. Economics deals with major aspects of human existence, production, consumption, interchange, uh, most of what keeps our life moving. Of course, economics carves out a narrow component of that. Uh, a richer study would be a political economy, which deals with how these specific questions of, uh, say, production interchange uh, are integrated into a broader socio-political framework. That's political economy. I think it gives uh, more uh, insight than, there's nothing wrong with abstracting particular components of a complex system. That's done all the time. We wouldn't have any physics if you didn't do that. But you have to be careful that uh, what's abstracted does not eliminate critical aspects of what you're studying. So, for example, if uh, phys physics abstracts away from friction and studies a ball rolling down a frictionless plane, that's okay. What it's leaving out doesn't affect the... Uh, inquiry into the laws of motion. On the other hand, if the political framework which determines the way businesses function is left out of the study of how businesses function, you lose a lot. So you have to be careful about abstraction. It's fine, brings out crucial elements that you can use as a way of more intimate, in, intricate studies of complex phenomena. That's all a contribution, but it has to be done with a, a kind of humility, awareness that you're studying something special and that there's much more happening. And if you leave out the other things that are involved, you may in fact distort your conclusions. Is that there's one pretty striking difference observed in the behavior of natural scientists and economists. I don't want to overgeneralize, but as a tendency, it's pretty obvious. So if you take a look at the uh, array of scientific papers, you know, lots of scientific papers coming out right now, of course, on things like uh, uh, effect of uh, human action on the environment. So what's happening to the, what can we do, say, let's take something specific. What can we do to slow down the catastrophic uh, growth in uh, PPM, particles, 
per, per million in the atmosphere. There are suggestions, uh, far, sometimes far reaching suggestions. So should we, for example, so uh, aerosols in the atmosphere to reflect sun's rays? But if you take a look at these suggestions, they're at least the serious ones are accompanied by saying, there's a lot we don't understand. We should, at most, we should try this on a very small scale. So if anything goes wrong, we can reverse it. Not just let's throw them all over the atmosphere and see what happens. That You don't read that except from cranks. On the other hand, take a look at the way economists deal with the economy. So for example, take the a major change like the onset of neoliberalism 40 years ago. Uh, there were some proposals, you know, some ideas, uh, uh, Milton Friedman, others. Well, let's just execute them and change the whole global economy. It's like hitting a complex system with a sledgehammer. We have some ideas about how it ought to work, so let's try it everywhere. Well, we can look at how it worked. Or shock therapy in uh, the Eastern European countries. We have a theory about three markets, so let's force it down. Let's impose it on them without taking a look at the nature of the societies. Uh, well, we know what happened there. Millions of deaths in Russia, economy collapsed, and oligarchs from the old Communist Party buy up the whole system, you get Putin. It's, it looks nice on paper, but when you try massive changes in a complex system, you have to be cautious. You can't just uh, come forward and say, we've proven that uh, you know, recessions are impossible because we have the tools to deal with it. Markets are efficient, forget everything else. Okay, You can't do that in a complex world. And in the natural sciences, there's a lot more caution. I think those are aspects of the kind of humility that I think is badly needed in many sectors of the profession. Well, I think this relates to just what I said. Economic science is, this, is in fact, if you take a look at the actual economic science, overwhelmingly it's the study of markets. How can markets work in pure forms? Okay, it's pretty much that's what it is, is nuances, but that's the core of the study. As I said before, you can learn things that way. You can learn about how a certain abstract model should function without uh, interferences. And from that you can uh, extract uh, principles, uh, conclusions, uh, you know, uh, things the way, uh, how things might happen, uh, you know, arrow theorem, uh, other things. Economic engineering is saying, what do we do in the complex systems of the world? Now, that involves many other factors besides the abstract model. Can learn from the abstract model. There are principles that you can think about how you might apply, but you have to do it in a way which deals with the complexities of the realities of human existence, society, political formations, and so on, which have a dramatic effect on how the economy works. I mean, just in gross terms, take a look at the post-World War II economy. Roughly, take the United States as a model. I mean, other countries have variations. Uh, so there's basically two, two periods. There's the period of so-called regimented capitalism, Second World War up until mid-70s, roughly. Then there's the period of neoliberalism, a reaction to regimented capitalism, late 70s to the present. They're radically different period of regimented capitalism had the highest growth rate in American history, uh, egalitarian growth, uh, uh, lower quintile actually did a little better than the upper quintile. Uh, uh, banks were banks, 
not financial institutions. A bank was a place where you put your money if you had something extra, they lent it to a guy who wanted to buy a car and so on. No financial crises, banks t tightly controlled, no tax havens, no shell companies, all illegal. Treasury Department enforced the law. Uh, a lot more to see, but that was basically the first period. Uh, wages tracked productivity. Minimal wages tracked productivity. Starting in the late 70s, it all changes. Uh, the, uh, uh, the relation between wages and productivity is dissolved. Productivity increases not as fast as before. The growth increases not as fast as before. Wages flatten, minimum wage flattens, means it actually reduces, if you consider inflation. Today, if that curve had been extrapolated, uh, minimum wage would probably be about 20 to $25, something like that an hour. It's about a third that at the moment. Uh, the, uh, the growth increased, but into very few pockets. So for example, when Reagan came in, the top, just take a look at the very top, top 0.1% of the population. Uh, they had about 10% of the wealth. Now it's double, 20% of the wealth. Uh, incredible figure. Uh, the Rand Corporation that just came out with the first major effort to study how much wealth was the lower 90% deprived of through neoliberal programs. In other words, if things had continued versus what happened, what's the gap in wealth? Well, for the lower 90%, which means working class and the middle class, $47 trillion, it's not small, not, not small money. And that leaves out the unknown, probably tens of trillions of dollars that have gone into tax havens and shell companies once Reagan opened the doors. That's how political, the political economy differs from the abstract models. Uh, this was all in the name of free markets, but you know what that means. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the nature of the political system was changed, not secretly, so Reagan and his inaugural address, this is echoed by Thatcher at the same time, uh, said, governments are the problem. Well, you eliminate governments, there are still decisions. So if they're not in the hands of government, where are they? In the hands of private enterprise, unaccountable private uh, tyrannies, in fact. And they have a responsibility. It's a crucial part of the neoliberal programs. Uh, Milton Friedman, the economics guru, announced in a famous article, 1981, uh, the sole responsibility of the management of a corporation is self-enrichment. Anything else violates fundamental principles. So transfer decisions to the hands of private unaccountable enterprises whose sole responsibility is self-enrichment. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what's going to happen. 40 years later, we see the results. I can go into the details. The one result is, of course, uh, can, they're seeing it all over in the United States, in Europe, many other places. Uh, anger, the resentment, uh, understandable justified uh, contempt for institutions, including capitalist institutions, just contempt across the board, political parties that you know, were the dominant ones, center left, center right for years, dissolving in a fertile terrain for demagogues who can come along and say, I'm your savior, uh, I'll take care of these bad people who are doing things to you. Uh, immigrants, uh, blacks, you know, the poor, any China, any convenient scapegoat that's around. 
uh, for Trump, uh, the World Health Organization, you, know, you name it. Uh, meanwhile, I'll stab you in the back with my actual uh, my actual legislative programs. We're seeing that happen everywhere. It's very dangerous. Well, these are part of economic engineering. It's what happens when you try to engineer an economy, not taking into account the complex framework in which your changes in, say, corporate law uh, are affecting things. Corporate law, of course, is in the hands of government. It's corporate law that says that uh, uh, you have to be devoted socially totally to self-enrichment. Incorporating is a gift from the government. You're getting privileges. In return for that, you have to follow laws. When the laws change in the political system, the whole economy changes radically. Numbers like $47 trillion is not small change, and that's a small part of it. You also had the vast growth of financial institutions, uh, by now dominant in the economy. There's an interesting comment on the economics profession here. Uh, after the 2008-2009 crisis, now, there was a very interesting article by Robert Solo, one of the leading very fine economists, Nobel laureate, uh, in the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he uh, looked at the, he, he, he noticed, he of course noticed, he recognized the vast growth of financial institutions, which to that point had about maybe 40% of uh, profits. And he said, this is a strange thing. Uh, we economists have never studied this. We've never studied what the effect is of financial, the enormous growth of financial institutions on the economy. A few scattered studies, but basically not a topic. It's not a topic in the study of you know, market models. And he said, that's strange. They had just crashed the economy again. So it's strange that we haven't done this. And he said, suppose we begin to study it, what are we likely to find? Well, he was speculating, but he said, we're likely to find that their net effect on the economy has probably been negative. Actually, when we look more closely, I think we find plenty of evidence for that. But that's part of the, what I call lack of humility and uh, narrowing of concerns from the considerations that economic engineering must take into account and cannot be, can use the results of economic science, cannot be governed by them. They leave out much too much. And with appropriate humility, this could be understood. No physicist will tell you that you ought to build a bridge just by looking at the laws of motion. There's too much else involved. It's a mixture. It provides tools from the study of abstract systems, provides useful tools which can be applied in uh, policy formation at least in principle, policy formation should be oriented towards the common good. In fact, it isn't. It's oriented towards the needs of those powerful enough to design and shape it. So for example, uh, let's be concrete, uh, take the World Trade Organization, theoretically designed on neoliberal principles, radically protectionist in the interests of private power, so the TRIPS, for example, intellectual property rights, are a radical uh, interference with market principles. They give exorbitant patent rights of a kind that had never existed before to uh, multinational corporations, to the huge pharmaceutical corporations, for example, grants them monopoly pricing rights uh, in effect. And we're, We've seen that for years, the drain 
on the general economy from the exorbitant uh, prices of pharmaceuticals, and even from the choice of which ones there are in the hands of private power, that price has been enormous. Uh, the one economist I know who's studied it carefully, Dean Baker, has, I don't remember his numbers, but huge numbers, huge part of GDP just goes into wild overpricing and wrong choice of pharmaceuticals. That's not a law of nature. They say they need it for innovation. You take a look at innovation, you find a different story. A, very, a lot of it, as throughout the whole economy, that comes from the taxpayer, either in government labs or, or just grants to private corporations. There are lots of other ways of organizing innovation that won't just yield extraordinary monopoly pricing rights to uh, pharmaceutical corporations that have money coming out of their ears. That's a very serious question right now. It's, the, it's part, a large part of the source of the coronavirus pandemic. It was actually known in 2003, pretty well known after the SARS epidemic, that another pandemic, a real pandemic was likely to come. And it was known how to deal with it, how to study to prepare for having the basis for getting the right vaccine, understanding the viruses and so on. And not a big secret. The drug companies weren't interested. It's not their business. Uh, Milton Friedman explained to them that their role is to enrich themselves. Okay, That's not economics. It's called economics. It's politics. The result is they're not going to spend money on uh, some uh, catastrophe that might happen in 10 years, or maybe you'll get a vaccine that people will use once and you won't make that much money for it. You want to make money tomorrow on things that sell. It's also a question of choice of things to look at. Like, you know, to work on malaria because the millions of people who are dying from it are poor. They don't have any money to pay. So you do other things. It applies in the rich countries as well. Uh, you know, all kinds of things you can get in different sort of uh, ways of getting rid of wrinkles, but not of fundamental diseases because to get rid of them once you've done. Uh, all of this is an extraordinary, not just an extraordinary distortion of the economic system, but having enormous human consequences. And this is a very live question right now, because right now, scientists once again are predicting that if when we finally emerge from the current crisis, there's other ones coming, which will very likely be worse. We've been lucky so far. Every one of the coronaviruses has either been highly contagious and not very lethal, like Ebola, or not very lethal and highly contagious, like COVID-19. Who's to say the next one won't be both? It's known how to prepare for it. Drug companies are not going to pick it up. It's not their business. The government can't pick it up because of the neoliberal doctrine. Government is the problem. Enormous government labs, great resources. The government does most of the basic work anyway on development of vaccines and uh, drugs, but then hands it over to private companies because government is the problem. So we have a socio-political system which is setting the stage for further disasters. And economic science can tell you that it wouldn't work like this in a free market. Well, they can tell you that. But that doesn't help economic engineering. We have to make decisions. And they're being made every day. A couple of days ago, uh, the United States government uh, pulled out of the uh, COVAX consortium. 170 countries or so working on trying to integrate efforts to create a vaccine, which would of course, if with cooperation, there's much more chance of achieving a successful result. Most powerful country in the world pulls out and impedes that. Uh, it also, not very, very effectively, but at least to some extent, the COVAX consortium is looking at distributional problems. 
how do we ensure that if there is a vaccine, it'll go to the people who need it, like poor people in Africa, won't be just monopolized by the rich countries. They're at least looking at that. The US says, no, not our business. We're going to do it ourselves. We want to, we'll monopolize it because we're just the master of the world. Well, it's not a joke. It has big effects. And things like that are happening all the time. And to just, you know, do economic engineering without thinking of all these things, that gives you very dangerous results. We've seen plenty of it. We're seeing it right now. So that's not a critique of economic science. It's a call for some understanding and humility, the kind of humility you see normally in the physical sciences. And pre-Trump, you used to see it in the uh, EPA, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency, or in the FDA, uh, which insists on careful testing before you throw things into the public. Now, a lot of that is being dismantled uh, just with the goal of, of increasing profit for private power, for the very rich and the private sector. That's, those are the circumstances of the world. You can't overlook them when you're doing economic engineering. Well, I mean, there are some economists who've tried to study the environmental crisis. The most famous is William Nordhaus, who has economic models in which he draws a conclusion about what's the most uh, economically efficient way to deal with the environmental catastrophe. Uh, his conclusion is uh, we should aim to live at a level of three degrees centigrade rise over pre-industrial levels. That's probably cataclysmic. I mean, the effects of that on the environment are extraordinary. I mean, we're seeing little tiny bits of it now at uh, you know one degree centigrade approximately, but nobody can guess what it's gonna be like at three degrees, but it might be horrendous. It might pass tipping points in uh, uh, Arctic ice melting could raise sea levels in 10 feet, all kinds of imponderables. Here's a perfect case of total lack of humility. I say my economic model says the most efficient thing is uh, three degrees centigrade. So let's aim for that. How much is taken account of there? Uh, what effect does that have on uh, the people of Bangladesh uh, with the coastal plain? Uh, which will be flooded, I mean, a couple hundred million refugees. Where do they go? What does that do to Asia? Okay, what does it do to Asia when the dwindling water supplies in South Asia, which already leave hundreds of millions without potable water? Now, what happens when the glaciers continue to melt, when the river flow declines, when Pakistan and India two nuclear armed countries uh, are facing water shortages and are struggling over the same water sources. How do you put that into your calcul into your economic model? I mean, you just can't. It's not the kind of factor that can fit into an economic model. And I can magnify this all over the world. You know, large parts of the world are, that are now inhabited are going to be virtually uninhabitable. If, on the course that's described. How, what's the number that you associate with that, that you plug into your economic model? These are imponderables. And if you're all rational about this, you'll apply the famous precautionary principle. Like when I take out fire insurance on my house, which I do, I could pretend to be an economist and say, Okay, let's calculate the risk uh, to my house of going on fire and the amount of money I lose in fire insurance and how much I could invest it for in a nice fund and make money and you know, go to the theater more often and so on. They're totally meaningless calculations. 
I watch fire insurance in my house, even if it's not economic, economically appropriate. And we are talking about the whole world. We want an insurance policy on the world. We don't want to face a 10% possibility that everything will just be destroyed. We don't want to face that. It doesn't matter what the economic moment says. There are other criteria involved. And uh, here again, a, a touch of humility and common sense and the attitudes of the natural sciences would be very salutary, I think. Ask the same question across the professional domains. Should uh, international relations scholars be held accountable for the fact that uh, they publish books uh, saying that America's mission is to install, install democracy over the world. Uh, should they, let's take the leading figure, uh, I mean, should they be held accountable to the consequences of that? Has consequences. Policymakers say our duty is to install democracy. So let's invade Iraq and destroy the country and set the Middle East to flames because our mission is to install democracy. Should they be held accountable to that? Well, it's not in the courts. In public opinion, yes. I think uh, I've been writing to a, the extent of boredom for the last 60 years on responsibility of intellectuals, all of them. And if you look over history, their role is not pretty way back to classical Greece. Overwhelmingly, they've been what are sometimes called stenographers for power. Actually, Henry Kissinger, a master of the art, put it very well. He said the duty of the intellectual advisor to government is to articulate the preferences of the powerful, to find ways of articulating it properly. So that means if uh, Richard Nixon gives him, and maybe in some half-drunken stupor, Richard Nixon hands him something, says, uh, bomb Cambodia in every possible way, then as a stenographer for power, he puts that precisely. He sends to the Air Force the words, I'm virtually quoting, massive bombing campaign in Cambodia, anything that flies against anything that moves uh, in uh, single, simple English that says genocide. Is he did articulate the uh, preferences of the powerful. Is he responsible for that? Well, not in, not the way laws are set up public opinion, he should be. And that's just, that happens to be an extreme example, but it's not all that unusual. Economists, the same. If they decide to hit the economy with a sledgehammer because of what some model says, yes, they should be held accountable. The terms of uh, political discourse and uh, commentary are pretty loose and vague. And that's true of capitalism, socialism, democracy. Uh, actually, I don't think these terms can have, terms get precise definitions within the framework of explanatory theories. Outside those theories, they, they never have precise definitions. So what's motion? What's energy? What's mass? What's velocity? These terms didn't have precise definitions until physics had reached a level of explanatory depth. You know, by 17th, 18th century, they were getting precise definitions, which were incidentally were not the general usage. Of course, the sciences very quickly depart from ordinary usage. If a a physicist is studying, say, work. 
He doesn't look up on employment statistics. It's a very specific, narrow, precise definition. Well, the social and political sciences haven't reached that point. They don't have far-reaching explanatory theories, except in pretty arcane domains, which are pretty remote from human life. So the answer to the question, what is capitalism, is just kind of more or less. I mean, to the extent that a society relies on markets, uh, to the extent that it relies on competition, on wage labor, on a boss-worker relationship, to that extent, it's more capitalist. To the extent it moves in other directions, it's less capitalist. So just in the United States, uh, maybe out at the extreme of capitalist societies, uh, the regimented capitalism of the first post-war era was a different capitalism from the uh, capitalist of the neoliberal era. And uh, others, you look at the Nordic societies, a different form of capitalism. Uh, take a look at uh, the family dictatorships of the Gulf, different form of capitalism, okay? So I don't think we can define it. There are elements of, first of all, we have no capitalist societies and nothing approximating what a capitalist society is supposed to be. What we actually have is many varieties of state capitalism. That included the old Soviet Union, included Maoist China, includes uh, the Gulf dictatorships, includes the United States, just different varieties of a mix of state intervention and uh, a reliance on the private sector and all kind of intimate interactions. That's true of almost everything we use. Like take what we're doing now. We're using computers, uh, internet, and satellites, microelectronics, and so on. Uh, where'd that come from? It came during the period of regimented capitalism, and mostly from the state, either direct state funding or state grants to private in institutions. Didn't really go on to the market for about 20, 25 years. The first usable uh, personal computer was 1977, after about 30 years of extensive research and development and innovation risk, uh, mostly in the public sector. The internet was the same. Didn't get privatized till the 90s. It was being developed in, I've seen the lab where I was working in the 1950s. It's, uh, uh, and that's across the board. The same with pharmaceuticals, the same with just about every aspect of the economy. It's a mixture of uh, uh, public, private mixture in various ways and different ways. Uh, what is the right way to deal with it? Well, we could debate that. My, my own feeling for what it's worth is uh, essentially the position of uh, the Republican Party under Abraham Lincoln. I think they had it about right. That wage labor is different from slavery only in that it's temporary until a person can become a free man or woman again. That was also the view of industrial workers in the late 19th century. They wanted to free themselves from the tyranny of a boss-worker relationship, which is a, an assault on human dignity and the Republican rights of free citizens. Uh, rich labor press going into this in detail. Major labor organizations like the Knights of Labor were based on the principle that in their words, those who work in the mills should own the, uh, the factory girls, so-called young women from the farms who were working in the textile mills, running their own quite lively, interesting press, took the same view. Now, the first populist movement, the real populist movement, not what's called populism today, radical farmers in Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, wanted to take control of their own uh, lives and enterprises away from the Northeastern bankers who lent the money, charged huge interest, uh, ran the markets. They wanted to do it themselves. They'd have their own banks, their own marketing, and so on, run democratically by participants. 
started to link up with the Knights of Labor, the most radical democratic popular movement in American history. It was crushed by force, but I think they had the right idea. We have to adapt it to new circumstances. Well, that's one point of view. You can take other points of view. It's current form, it's suicidal. Definitely, clearly suicidal. The present form of capitalism says, let's destroy the environment in which humans can survive. Heading right in that direction. Just take a look at the extrapolate from what's been happening. It's exactly what you get. And it's true that Trump is carrying it to an extreme. He's saying, let's race to disaster. Okay, others are saying, let's try to mitigate it. But in its current form, it's heading for disaster. Now, can it's can there be modifications within the framework of established capitalist institutions that will reverse this course? Yes, there can be. That's basically what the Green New Deal is about, as it's developed by the most careful practitioners, people like uh, my colleague and co-author, Robert Pollan, economist at the University of Massachusetts, detailed, careful analysis of how we could meet the UN goals, uh, having, uh, cutting in half emissions by 2030, uh, net zero emissions by 2050. We could do it uh, within, easily within the expenditures a fraction of the expenditures that are even used to prop up the economy by the treasury outflows during the pandemic, far less than during World War II. And Jeffrey Sachs, another fine economist, has used slightly different models, comes out with about the same conclusions. Now here, incidentally, is very significant work that economists can do using their tools and their knowledge and taking account of real world conditions. And I think they and some others show quite convincingly that without a fundamental change in existing institutions, we have the means within a few decades to put a stop to the suicidal tendencies of capitalism. We can't hand take care of what's already been done. And that's done and it's going to last um, and the destruction of the environment that has already taken place extends into the future, no matter what we do. Stop fossil fuels tomorrow, still going to continue. We can't stop it. These processes are underway. But we can constrain them. We can control them. Have a good chance of creating not only a livable world, but a much better one. We have a much better one world if we were not driven by the needs of private profit and private consumption, and we were concerned with the common good. Very straightforward ways. We'd all be better off if we had high quality mass transportation than if we were sitting in traffic jams for a couple hours a day to try to get to work. But the system has been set up, so it's gotta be the latter, not the former. The government is the problem. Can't do that. Uh, we, we see it. These are decisions that are made constantly. We're not, we're not talking in outer space. We're talking about decisions that are made every day. They can be oriented towards the common good. They can be oriented towards private profit and private consumption. Uh, those are not consistent notions. So more of one or more of the other. Uh, but these are very direct decisions. And I should say that the careful studies of people like Paul Pollan, Jeff Sachs are showing what economists could do at, the be at their best, using the tools that have been developed, not only for practical purposes, but for purposes that are essential for human survival. Can't be better than that.
Green New Deal quite consciously uh, keeps within the framework. I mean, I'm talking about the careful proposals for a Green New Deal. There's all kinds of proposals around. But ones like, say, Poland and Sachs uh, keep explicitly within the framework of capitalist institutions. I don't think the architects of this system necessarily believe that those are the best institutions. In fact, I know that they don't. But uh, if you look at time scales, the time scale necessary to overcome the urgent crisis that we're facing is far shorter than the time scale necessary to change institutions. It doesn't mean one or the other. You can be working in the background to create the consciousness, the elements of a future society within the present one. But we have an urgent need, actually an even more urgent need. We have to get rid of the malignancy in the White House. If that's not done, all of this is moot. All of it. Because we'll be driving to disaster. But assuming that that cancer can be excised in November, which is by no means certain, uh, then the next urgent task, it's actually two, is to deal decisively with the economic, with the uh, environmental crisis, we have the tools to do this, get rid of nuclear weapons, which are an immense threat, get prepared for the next pandemic, which we can do, reverse the deterioration of democracy, and then beyond that, look into the nature of institutions. I mentioned the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln. Basically, he was taking the stand of classical liberalism, one which actually goes back to classical Greece and Rome, Cicero and others. Now, the idea that one person should be dependent on the orders of another is intolerable, except in, say, extreme conditions, like a three-year-old child is dependent on the decisions of the parent. But for, uh, for society to be organized on the principle that you spend almost all your waking hours under the rules of a tyrant with total control over you, way beyond what Stalin dreamed of. Uh, Stalin didn't say you can take a bathroom break at three o'clock or you have to wear these clothes and go from this spot to another spot in the Amazon warehouse or whatever. Uh, the idea that most of your waking hours are spent that way, I think, is intolerable. And that can be overcome, can be overcome pretty much the way the Knights of Labor were talking about it. Those who work in the mills should own them. Enterprises should be in the hands of participants, workers, community. Uh, we can have de much more rich democratic systems without uh, systems of what are, in my view, totally illegitimate authority. Okay, it's not unfeasible. In fact, you could even call it capitalism if you want. Call it whatever you like. Uh, but it, it's a very different system. And I think those moves in that direction are appropriate, necessary, over the longer term. Meanwhile, we have immediate crises that must be overcome, or else none of these discussions mean anything. I mean, I, I'm adding now a question for myself, uh, um, uh, by myself. Um, um, I, I'm not reading big optimism, yeah, uh, out of you, out of what you are saying. Um, obviously, the problems are extremely uh, urgent, uh, yeah, extremely, extremely big, yeah. My question is, uh, seeing the, the, the human, uh, the human condition, yeah, is it, uh, is it a f something like comfortable or is it uh, incompetence? Uh, is it stupidity or is something mean working on it? It's not stupidity. I mean, Milton Friedman was a very intelligent person. I'm not competent to judge, but competent economist. He was a very good economist. Uh, it was not stupidity when he said the role of the private sector is solely self-enrichment. That's ideology, not stupidity. I mean, I happen to think it's a stupid conclusion, but 
he wasn't making it on the basis of stupidity or incompetence. Uh, the case of Bolsonaro, I, let me not judge, but I think it's, we might notice the fact that the three countries that are pretty much in the lead in moving towards autocracy and de destruction of democracy also happen to be in the lead in number of deaths and cases of the virus. The United States, India, Brazil. The next one in line is Russia, also not exactly a model of democracy. Is this an accident? Well, you can decide. I don't think so. I think that's inherent in autocratic control and uh, demonization and ignoring science uh, because uh, we're smarter than we're better than anyone else. We just run things. It's typical in Brazil, typical here, dramatic. Same in India, killing the intellectual sectors. I think these things are related, but I don't think they're stupidity. The answer to specific power needs, and in some cases, personal needs, but mostly fundamental power. Trump would not remain in office if he did not understand that his prime duty is to enrich the very rich and the private sector. Uh, he can talk all he likes to white collar workers, to working blue collar workers, it's about how much he loves them. But at the same time, he's stabbing them in the back. Every legislative proposal, uh, whether it's a tax scam for the rich or uh, cutting back uh, safety and health regulations, is stabbing working people and the lower middle class in the back. Uh, same with Bolsonaro, same with Modi. Kind of an interesting phenomenon, they keep popularity, but it's a different matter. Dictators and demagogues often do, not because they're helping people. The, uh, but but these, these are very, I think you're raising very serious issues. I mean, and uh, in the, I, in, many, in different countries, they have different roots, different characteristics and so on, but there are some common features. I think one common feature is the neoliberal assault of the last 40 years. It's had different effects in different places, but similar ones. And it has led to this atmosphere of anger, uh, contempt for institutions, uh, resentment, uh, search for some leader, maximal leader who save us from all of this and blame somebody. So in India, you can blame the Muslims. Uh, in the United States, you can blame uh, the immigrants, uh, the World Health Organization. Yes, well. Somewhere else, you can blame the Kurdish immigrants, whatever it is. But blame somebody, not the sources that are responsible. That's the nation nature of demagogic leadership, not for the first time in history. Plenty of examples. Mm -hmm.